We're in the middle of an obesity epidemic. We're in the middle of an opioid epidemic. I think we all know this. And what did I learn in medical school? Willpower. So if my patients want to quit smoking, set a quit date, tell all your buddies to help support you, we'll give you some medications to help with the side effects, and then quit smoking, right? What I learned in medical school about trying to lose weight, we learned a formula that apparently is still being taught, calories out versus calories in. It's not that the formula is wrong, but we're told, you know, we tell our patients, oh, just make sure you eat salad instead of cake, make sure you exercise, but you can just see how these go up against uh, great odds. So what I'm going to argue is that we might actually not be tapping into something in the brain and the mind that we actually already know and that we're just not paying attention to. There's a guy back in the 50s, many of you might know him, B.F. Skinner, studied animal behavior. In fact, he found that he could train pigeons to win a cross-court shot in ping pong for a food reward. Came up with a theory called it operant conditioning or positive and negative reinforcement. In fact, uh, Eric Kandel uh, won the Nobel Prize for this, showing that this is evolutionarily conserved all the way back to the sea slug. So we know the elements. It's, I think of this as a habit loop. We have um, a trigger, a behavior, and a reward. So our, we see some food, we eat the food, and our stomach sends the signal to our brain that says, remember what you ate and where you found it. So rock solid theory, here's Eric Kendall receiving his Nobel Prize, reproducible all the way back to the sea slug. Now I learned about this in college, I didn't think that much of it, but as I was starting my careers in addiction psychiatrist, I was really struggling to help my patients change their behaviors. You know, working with my patients who were addicted to cocaine or heroin and just saying, you know, stop, control yourself, didn't work very well. And I had this aha moment, I had this light bulb moment, where I realized, wait a minute, this explains a whole lot more than just these classical addictions. You know, we learn to eat food, not when we're hungry, but when we're anxious. We learn to take pills to numb ourselves from emotional and physical pain. We learn to look at key pictures of puppies on Instagram when we're bored. In fact, social media is designed for those likes and those retweets. Food is engineered to be addictive. So why doesn't willpower work? Well, we do know some things neuroscientifically. One is that willpower relies on a part of the brain called the prefrontal cortex. Interestingly, this is the youngest and weakest part of the brain from an evolutionary perspective. It's the first that goes offline when we get stressed out. So if we can't rely on this, what can we rely on? What I'm going to argue is that awareness itself might help us change behavior. You might think that's crazy. I actually gave a TED talk on this a couple of years ago. It ended up being the fourth most watched talk of the year. I don't think it was me, but it was the message, which was very simple, which is awareness trumps self-control. And by this, I mean bringing awareness to the results of our behaviors. Reward-based learning is based on rewards, not on the behaviors themselves. Pigeons aren't particularly prone to playing ping pong, but they will play for food. So there's another part of, bit of neuroscience that you need to know that, that helps explain this. It's a part of our brain called the orbitofrontal cortex that's involved in reward valuation and storage. So for example, if I eat some milk chocolate, my brain's going to compare that to other foods that I've eaten, say broccoli. My brain says, oh, milk chocolate, I'll have that over broccoli. If I eat some dark chocolate, my brain compares those. And for me, dark chocolate trumps milk chocolate. And so it sets up this hierarchy of, of rewards. I think of the OFC as the BBO part of the brain. It's always looking for that bigger, better offer. So how does this relate to awareness? Is awareness actually enough to hack our brains into better health? This question actually helped change my career from studying molecular biology to learning cognitive neuroscience, even founding a startup company to make app-based behavior change program so we could answer this simple question, is awareness enough to change behavior? We did something really simple. We used mindfulness training 
to help people pay attention to the results of their behaviors. Here are some examples. This is somebody who used mindfulness training uh, to work with smoking. Pay attention to the results of smoking. What happens? Reward value drops. Pay attention to the results of overeating or stress eating. What happens? The reward value drops. And with this drop in reward value, it opens up the space for that bigger, better offer. Now, what if I said that awareness itself, and in particular, the attitude of curiosity is that bigger, better offer. Here's an example of somebody uh, using one of our uh, app-based mindfulness training programs for anxiety. She said, when I first started the program, I didn't quite buy into the benefits of curiosity. Today, I felt a wave of panic, and instead of immediate dread or fear, my automatic response was, hmm, that's interesting. So you can see how her brain was starting to prefer curiosity to worry or anxiety. It feels better. Now, Examples are illustrative, but results are definitive. So my lab's gone on to do the studies. And this is still an early field, but uh, the early results are promising. For example, in a study of, of obese and overweight women who received app-based mindfulness training uh, for, uh, for eating, we found a 40% reduction in craving-related eating. We saw a 35% reduction in eating to cope with negative emotions. So you can see how they're hacking into this, this reward-based learning loop. In a study of anxious physicians, right, physician anxiety and burnout is at epidemic proportions, we saw a 57% reduction in clinically validated anxiety symptoms. We use the GAD7 in this case. We even saw a 50% reduction in some burnout symptoms, even though we didn't train them in burnout at all. But the two are highly correlated. Now, we've gone on to map the brain regions that are involved in this process and the networks. There's a network called the default mode network. Many of you are familiar with this. This network gets activated when we get caught up in craving. It's activated when we get caught up in perseveration or rumination when we're anxious. And this same network gets deactivated when we're paying attention. I'm gonna let uh, Anderson Cooper describe this to you because he does a much better job than I do. This is just the next generation of exercise. We've got the physical you know, exercise components uh, down, and now it's about working out how can we actually train our minds. Dr. Brewer is trying to understand how mindfulness can alter the functioning of the brain. He uses a cap lined with 128 electrodes. We're going to start filling each of these 128 wells with conduction gel. The electrodes are able to pick up signals from the posterior cingulate, part of a brain network linked to memory and emotion. This is all just picking up electrical signal from the top of your head. Since attending the mindfulness retreat, I'd been meditating daily and was curious to see if it had an impact on my brain. We're going to have you start with thinking of something that was very anxiety provoking for you. Okay. When I thought about something stressful, the cells in my brain's posterior cingulate immediately started firing, shown by the red lines that went off the chart on the computer screen. Just drop into meditation. Okay. When I let go of those stressful thoughts and refocused on my breath, Within seconds, the brain cells that had been firing quieted down, shown by the blue lines on the computer. That's really fascinating to see like that. Dr. Brewer believes everyone can train their brains to reach that blue mindfulness zone, but he says all the technology we're surrounded by makes it difficult. So we can actually start to bring all of this stuff together. Um, we've just finished a study where we brought people in who wanted to quit smoking. We could scan their brains at baseline after we showed them smoking cues, and we could measure how much their default mode network got activated, then randomize them to get mindfulness training or gold standard treatment, scan their brains a month later, and see if we could predict clinical outcomes. What we found was a very strong correlation between a reduction in default mode network activity and a reduction in cigarette smoking, and this was specific to the mindfulness training group. We also saw a dose-dependent relationship. The more modules people completed, the better they did. No correlation in the control group, even though they completed the exact same number of modules. And so just bringing all of this together, what I'm going to argue is that we actually know a whole lot about how addictions and habits are formed. Everything from everyday addictions like our cell phones and eating to classical addictions like cocaine and heroin. We also know that we can start to hack this process by understanding how our minds work. We can bring awareness in to do two things. One, help us become disenchanted with these old behaviors, but also bring that bigger, better offer in, like curiosity, that might have been right in front of our noses all along. 
you know, our brains are actually really strong. We just have to really understand how they work and we can tap into their potential. Then we can move from, you know, pushing on a door that's really closed, hoping that we can open it, to stepping back, looking around, seeing that there's a handle, opening it and walking through. Thank you very much. <laughs>